Well, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Jack Hoffman to you, and he probably doesn't need any introduction. Uh, he's certainly one of Canada's most illustrious statisticians and, and one of the leading uh, statisticians really in the world in many areas. He's made contributions across a very wide range of uh, areas of statistical theory and methodology ranging from survival analysis to estimating functions and the bootstrap and geometry of mixtures and I could say a lot more. Uh, of course, he also has a long connection with Waterloo, uh, arriving here in 1962 as an undergraduate student. Sorry, Jack, I know they didn't think you were that old, but <laughs> <laughs> same year I did, isn't yes. so well. <laughs> Uh, and um, Jack, uh, like myself, we, we took almost all of our undergraduate statistics from Dave Sprott. Uh, and uh, not only that, but I think you were his first PhD student, I believe, or right. first successful mm -hmm. one. So Jack was... <laughs> <laughs> there may be others who started earlier who gave up along the way. But anyway, it's particularly appropriate that Jack's... Lecture, I'm sure we'll hear a bit about Dave. Uh, Jack's received many, many honors for his work. He's a, uh, just to keep it brief, he, he's a gold medal winner of the Statistical Society of Canada and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Uh, he's a Fisher lecturer for the Committee of Presidents of Statistical Societies. And uh, I don't think I need say more, just that uh, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing him talk to us today. Yeah. I don't think I need that. <clears throat> so thank you, Jerry. Um, yeah, so back to 1962, Jerry and I were actually lab partners in chemistry when we arrived at uh, University of Waterloo in the fall of 1962, and both graduated 50 years ago this spring. So there was a, so I came down here a bit earlier for a 50th reunion, 50th class reunion, my undergraduate years, which, uh, I can remember in earlier years seeing the people that were coming back for the 50th <laughs> reunion. It's hard to believe that I've reached that state, but there you go. Yeah. Anyway, it's, it's, it's nice to be back. I, I certainly have very fond memories from Waterloo and, uh, and, and know so many people here. And it's really great to have this opportunity to uh, uh, talk in the Sprott Lecture Series. Um, so David Sprott actually is... is Jerry said both, taught both Jerry and me most of our undergraduate statistics um, and, uh, and good part of the graduate statistics as well. Um, <clears throat> he was, uh, um, and, and, and I had the pleasure of being his first uh, PhD student. So I, don't, I don't know about the failures before me, but uh, um, the, the first PhD student, and, and I learned an awful lot from David. He had. Uh, I mean, he had a, a real enthusiasm for the subject and real interest in, uh, in statistical methods and statistical ideas. And uh, I, I think probably I, I learned, what I learned from him really had a lot to do with how to, how to approach a statistical problem or a scientific problem and to think about that problem and what, what's the scientific issue that one's trying to address. And I think that's something that's often not laid out clearly in, in statistics and in statistical analyses, and it was something that he kept very much at the forefront. You can see that in his book on, uh, on likelihood methods. He was a very strong proponent of likelihood methods and in inference and, uh, um, <coughs> and uh, made very substantial contributions, I think, to the, the linkage there between theory and, and practice. That, uh, so David was, uh, he was also, as I said, was the, the dean of the faculty. Um, when I first met him, he was, that was, uh, in undergraduate statistics, and he talked about his first job, which was at uh, 1001 Queen Street West, which he said that his, after he graduated from Toronto, they sent him to the Ontario Lunatic Asylum, which was what it had been called, not at that point, but years before. Um, <coughs> but uh, quite a famous address. It was then, then Toronto Psychiatric, and he was working with the psychology department in Toronto. Um, <coughs> How about just a few other pictures that I thought were sort of interesting. This is a picture of, of David and his wife, Muriel. There was a conference here in 1970 on the foundations of, of inference, and this was a, a book that David and, and Professor Gadambi um, edited. 
And uh, you can see, actually, if you haven't got a copy, you can still get them. They're available on Amazon. The price used to range from somewhere around 37 cents to $1,000, but they're much more expensive now. The cheapest is at $274.99, and you can pay up to $1,056 if you want, plus $3.99 in shipping. But, uh, <laughs> so if you have a copy on your bookshelf, you might, uh, you might want to keep it, I think. It's, <laughs> getting more valuable with time. This is a picture of the computer science building. This was just before the faculty was formed in 1966. And uh, <clears throat> two associate deans of the time, Ken, Ken Fryer and Arthur Beaumont, and David looking like they're looking at, at blueprints for the building, but actually it's the student newspaper they're looking at. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> um, and that was just as, as Dave was becoming dean of the faculty. The original department chairs here um, in the dean's office, I think it's still the dean's office in the in the math and computing building. And uh, <clears throat> this is actually the the deans of math from the last century. With uh, David here, that was a later picture toward the end of the of the 1990s. Uh, um, David here at the front on the left, but a very good-looking group. And uh, Rudinia Caracas, I think it was her retirement was the occasion of this. But, <clears throat> so anyway, it is a great pleasure because I, I learned so much from Dave and uh, really valued the um, linkage that I had with him over the year. And I think there's no question that the development and strengths of the University of Waterloo had a lot to do with, uh, with, with David's leadership and uh, his, uh, his view of statistics. Right? So what I was going to talk to today is, is about um, something a bit, maybe a bit offbeat, I guess. It's not as, as um, statistical as many other things I do, but it's, a, but it's a, a project that I got involved with in about three years ago or so, four years ago, um, and has been uh, uh, something I spent a fair bit of time looking at, basically, to, uh, I've got a few extra S's there and distinguished, I see, but anyway. Um, <coughs> Uh, got involved with in, in um, looking at uh, kidney pair donation and uh, have joint work with, with several people. Matthew Bray, um, John Lee, and Wen Wang are all PhD students in biostatistics. John Lee has graduated. And then colleagues, Peter Song, who used to be here actually now at Michigan, and Alan Leichtman and uh, Michael Reese. Alan is a, is a transplant nephrologist and Michael Reese is a transplant surgeon. Uh, working on this this problem, so <clears throat> so matchmaking in a kidney pair donation program, um, and uh, <clears throat> so where this is dealing with with patients who need a kidney, and uh, and 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 have with kidney failure, you either have to have dialysis or a transplant to survive, but it is unlike other organ failures, in as much as uh, other essential organs, in that there is dialysis, a way that uh, um, can keep people living a, a, a life of reasonable quality, even with kidney failure. But transplant is the preferred, the preferred uh, uh, treatment. And there are two sources of kidney for transplantation. There's a, a deceased donors, um, so people who die and leave their kidneys for donation or other organs for donation. Um, people who need a kidney get it from that source. In addition, there are living donors, so people who our need of a kidney may have someone, a friend or a family member, um, who's willing to donate a kidney to them. And uh, so both deceased and living donors, there aren't nearly enough organs. And uh, in, in the US, for example, it's about over 90,000 patients in, in the US are on the, were on the waiting list at the end of 2014. Um, over 33,000 new patients joined the list in that year and only 16,000 received a kidney transplant. So there's a, sh there's a shortage there that needs to be addressed or that it would be great to address. And, uh, <clears throat> that, uh, um, and of course, 6,600 patients died or became too sick to transplant and maybe would have had better outcomes with a transplant. <clears throat> so this situation, many patients have these living donors that would be willing to give them a kidney, but the issue that arises is that there's often an incompatibility. And so because of blood type, which requires the same kind of match as for a blood donation, or because of, uh, of, of sensitivity of the candidate to antigens of the donor, the transplants can't take place. 
So people are, they have a, a, a donor, but they're incompatible, and, and so the donor can't be used. <clears throat> so the idea of kidney pair donation was uh, um, one that came from, uh, from Rappaport in a, in a paper in 1986, and has now there are kidney pair donation programs in various, in various countries and several in the United States. But the idea here is to, is to exchange kidneys between, um, to, to exchange donors basically. So if, you're, if you've got an incompatible donor and I have an incompatible donor, then we may be able to overcome the incompatibilities by your donor giving to me and my donor giving to you. So this is, a, is a, what's called a kidney exchange. And uh, if, if in fact you're actually doing exchanges like this, then you have to do these things simultaneously to avoid people reneging. But, uh, um, but you can do then, then a two-way exchange, or here's a three-way exchange is also illustrated, or of course you could do four-way or higher order exchanges too. Logistically, it's very hard to do a longer cycle than three. So mostly, mostly cycles of size three are the largest attempted. With a cycle of size three, you have to have six operating rooms um, to remove the kidneys and, and transplant the kidneys, and, uh, and all these things have to be done simultaneously. So the logistics are very difficult, and the other thing is that there's a probability that things will break when you do choose a chain, and you won't be able to do anything. So with long chains, that's more likely than, long cycles, that's more likely than with, with short ones. So we actually consider cycles up to three pairs. So, so a, th a three-way or a two-way cycle. In addition to cycles, the other thing that's happening in these KPD or these kidney pair donation programs, which are arranging these exchanges, is that uh, um, there are people that are called non-directed donors or altruistic donors, and really also all of these donors are altruistic, but uh, I'll use that term anyway. An altruistic donor is somebody who, who, who is willing to give a kidney to the pool. So they'll give a kidney to a candidate, but they don't have a specific person in mind. And so what, what happens there is if you have an altruistic donor, then they can give to a candidate in the pool with the understanding that the donor of that candidate will give to another candidate in the pool and so forth, and thus creating a chain. So you could do a chain of length two, three, four, or the chains can continue in, in, over time and build up longer and longer chains. So these altruistic donors are actually a very important component of, of the pool, and, and, and it is a high degree of altruism, of course, but. Uh, um, but relatively, relatively common within the pools that there are several such donors. <clears throat> I think I'm missing some slides here. Okay, so so in the so in these these so you you can see a graph here that we've got with uh, um, showing these exchanges. So in the three-way exchange, we can see that D1 is giving to, to C2, D2, donor 2 is given to C3, and then D3 back to C1. We think of it that way, or we can think of it just as a simple graph, so that we've got a directed graph with an arrow saying that there's a transplant possible from the donor at the first node to the candidate, the second. And so here we've got just a simple, a simple graph with three, with three nodes, one for each pair, okay? and then indicating what transplants are possible in this, so that, so that one to two, two to three, and back to one. <clears throat> and similarly, exchange one to two. So we're going to actually think about these paired donation programs. So we have these, these groups of pairs, okay, or perhaps altruistic donors, and uh, they, they come into the pool, and we're interested in possibly arranging matches. So the pairs are all incompatible one with another. Okay? And what we'd like to do is, is determine what donor can give to what candidate. And one way of getting some information on that is through a virtual cross-match test so that uh, you look at the blood types of the donors, you look at uh, the sensitivities of the candidates and the, and the HLA antigens of the donors, and from that you can, you can tell if there's going to be a problem, at least most of the time, so that you can rule out certain transplants. Other ones are potentially compatible, so that we have... Uh, so we have what's called a virtual cross-match, which is done by the computer, mainly based on blood tests and, and, and um, sensitivities. And uh, that suggests that we've got a donor here that might be able to give to, candidate, to the candidate of another pair. And so we think about things then in a graph where we have these edges going from one pair to another if the virtual cross-match is 
is, 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 is negative. If, you, if it looks like that donor could give to the candidate. In fact, that's not enough so that we can look at these virtual cross matches and they get better all the time. But still, when, when you actually go about doing a transplant, you have to do what's called a lab cross match and you have to incubate um, the candidate serum with uh, white cells of the donor to see whether there's a reaction, if there's going to be a rejection. And so there's what's called a lab cross match as well that needs to be done in order to decide whether or not you can go ahead with the transplant. <coughs> And in fact, it's impossible to do all these lab tests. Okay, so what you've got is the virtual test, and there are these, these pools become quite large, and there are many possibilities that have to be looked at. You can look at the virtual cross matches, but you have to decide which ones you're going to examine further. Yeah. <clears throat> so you can have a failure because of a positive lab cross match, or because the candidate or donor is sick or unavailable. That also happens quite frequently. Um, or um, because a candidate or a donor objects to the match. They don't like the, the match that they've got and will decide not to participate. So we, even once you you've pick out some transplants you're going to try, there's a very good chance that failures will occur, that you won't be able to proceed. Then. And so it's that problem that we're trying to look at, is how do we go about choosing which candidates to look at further about possibly being able to make transplants. Yeah. To give you an idea of some of the complexity of it, this is actually a, a, a relatively small, I think there's 32 patient, 32, 31 pairs and one altruistic donor here, which is the blue rectangle is the altruistic donor. And the arrows in this graph are indicating where there are potential, um, potential of the donor to give to the candidate, another pair. Um, the dark lines actually are those that are in two-way or three-way exchanges. There's actually more that would show up if you put it in chains, but th those are just the two-way and three-way exchanges. And uh, the magenta lines actually are, are things I'll talk about later, but that's actually a chosen exchange, or ch chosen things to look at. But... Okay, and, and from here you can see that the, pr the problem quickly becomes quite complex. And just to give you some idea here, if you look at uh, two-way and three-way cycles, if you have 100 pairs and the chance of an edge between a donor and a between two pairs, the chance that of an edge is, uh, is 0.2, then it ends up that uh, on average you see um, 372 two-way or three-way cycles. By the time you get up to 400, it's 20, 22,000. So the, the, the problem is complex. Yeah. And if you add altruistic donors to that, it goes up even much more quickly, many possibilities with altruistic donors. No. So the work I'm going to talk about actually relates to work of Alvin Roth, which I, sh who I should mention was uh, um, won the Nobel Prize in Economics for work on kidney pair donation and some of the methods I'll talk about are things that he developed. Uh, the, in the Nobel Prize it said it was for finding stable matches, which sounds like a, a love exchange somehow, but uh, it actually was the kidney pair donations. So. <coughs> So we're going to represent a kidney pair donation program as a directed graph. So we've got a graph G with a set of vertices V and a set of edges E. Okay. And uh, so I'll, I'll label those vertices 1 up to N. Those are the pairs. So that's the candidate donor pair. And then N plus 1 up to N plus D, there are D altruistic donors. So we're going to think about a graph like that. <coughs> so N incompatible pairs and e, D altruistic donors. There are complications on this in that individuals can have more than one donor. You, some individuals come with three or four donors with whom they're incompatible. And so that uh, is an additional complication I'm not going to talk about. So just we'll think about either pairs or altruistic donors. And we have an edge in E that goes from I to J. We'll indicate it as bracket I, J, but indicates that a donor at vertex I is potentially compatible. That is, virtual cross match works for a candidate at vertex J. So we've got these arrows if the virtual cross match is negative. <clears throat> and so we get a picture like this, a very small program with only six vertices and lots of possibilities, of course. But, uh, um, <clears throat> and uh, so we have here, we've got six as an altruistic donor in that picture. And we've got the arrows showing that six can give to four. Um, and uh, other exchanges possible. And we think in terms of exchange cycles, which are exchanges, two-way exchanges or three-way exchanges, so the obvious 
definition of a cycle on a graph. So a cycle of, of length k, we first one can give to the second, second to the third, k minus first to the kth, and then the kth back to the first, so it completes the cycle. Or a chain where we start with an altruistic donor and the chain the donor gives to one pair and then the donor from that pair gives to another and so forth and sets up a chain of length k, c naught to c1 to ck, so k donations, k, k transplants. <clears throat> so we've got a picture here of a small, um, of a small program with uh, just one altruistic donor and five pairs. And uh, we can see that we've got cycles here. If you look at the cycles first, there's a cycle here between one and two that I could do. There's a cycle one, two, three. Right? There's a cycle between three and four. That's it for cycles. And if you look at chains, there's all sorts of them. And chains are, they, these altruistic donors are very valuable from that respect because six, we've got six, four, six, four, five, six, four, three, six, four, three, one, six, four, three, two are all possibilities in here. Okay. <clears throat> of course, this is a very small chain. I showed you a picture earlier of the Michigan run, but that's actually also relatively small. But, uh... <clears throat> okay, so we have chains and cycles, and what we'd like to do is, is get ways of choosing chains and cycles that are, in some sense, optimal, or at least that's the first approach we might think of. So we've got a picture like this. How do we choose chains and cycles in order to get the best result that we can? Okay. And so I'm going to look actually at a simpler problem just to show you how that's done, which is kind of cute. This is essentially uh, the idea that uh, um, Alvin Roth had. Um, so we've got here a, a very small KPD with just four nodes and no altruistic donors, just pairs. Um, <clears throat> so the first, we've got a KPD and we've got the graph of it here. So we've got these five donors. These are the virtual cross matches that we've got. So the first thing we're going to do is then enumerate all the cycles that we have in this, in this chain, in this, in this graph rather, um, <clears throat> which we can do. And you see here that we've got one, two, one, two, three, and three, four are the cycles. I show cycles with the triangular ang angular brackets. <clears throat> and uh, so now we're going to want to choose disjoint exchanges or cycles that maximize the total number of transplants. So, now, I'm not worrying about failures now, I'm just assuming everything works. Okay? And if you look at this, you can see that C1 and C3, I don't need any, anything fancy here. That, that's the solution, obviously, right? in terms of maximizing the number of transplants. That's the best we can do. <clears throat> but actually, we can formulate that as a mathematical problem like this, so that we say that, uh, so I've got a decision variable here, y1, y2, y3. So y1 equals 1 if I choose the first chain, or the first cycle and zero otherwise, y2 is one or zero, y3, so it's telling me which cycles I'm going to choose. Okay. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and if I choose the first cycle, I get, I get two points, right, because I get two transplants. So I choose the second one, I get three. The third one, I get two. Okay. And now I've got, I can formulate all of this as an integer programming problem, and that carries forward to any such thing. So I, so I want to maximize the total number of transplants, well, the total number of transplants is 2 times y1, 2 or 0, right? plus 3 times y2, plus 2 times y3. So that's the, most, that's the total number of transplants I get. I want to make that as big as possible, while keeping in mind that I can't use people twice. Okay? I can only use them once. Okay? And so as a consequence, I, um, y1 plus y2 is less than or equal to 1, and that's because y1 is in, 1 is in, C1 and it's also in C2, so you can't do both of them. Right? Two for two, two, it's also in C1 and C2. And similarly, Y2 plus Y3 is less than or equal to one because uh, um, three is in both of them, so I can't do both of those. Right? Uh, and that's the only restriction, actually, because there's no restriction. C1 and C3 can both be done at the same time. Okay? Um, and so I've got maximize this subject to those restrictions where y1, y2, y3 are in 0, 1. So that's an integer programming problem, it's called. Right? And it's, um, if it's, it's a very hard problem to actually solve this. In fact, it's NP hard if you restrict the length of the, of the chains and the, the cycles. Um, <coughs> but, uh, I mean, but here you can Im immediately see, in fact, that the solution we've got over here is also going to come out of this problem. Okay? And that problem actually, as I said, can be extended to 
whatever, and that's essentially the approach that Roth used in 2007. And what we're going to do actually is, going to, is, is still using that basic idea, but we're going to, instead of looking for chains and cycles, we're going to try and take into account the idea that things can fail. Okay? So we're going to bring in the stochastic aspects that after we choose who to look at, they may fail. And in fact, they commonly do fail. They often do fail. <clears throat> so if we, but implementing this, this approach, and uh, we've done a fair bit actually in implementing this so that we need a, a graph search thing which will find algorithm that will find all the cycles and the chains in a given graph. Okay? And then once we've got that, um, and, and typically we restrict the size. We, we, we're going to look at chains of size four or less, let's say, and cycles of size three or less. That's partly for logistical reasons, and it's partly because longer things tend to fail. Okay? If you have a lot of, you try and do a long chain, it typically will break. You won't be able to do it. But. <clears throat> so anyway, we find all these cycles and chains and then set it up as an IP problem just as, as before. And the IP problem you can, you can write down generally here, and it's just the same as before, except it looks more complicated. Okay? So we're going to, we've got these indicators, y1 up to, why i is, is the indicator that the cycle ci or chain ci is chosen, it's zero or one, and then we want to maximize here just some y i had before, but here I could put in a utility too. So I could say some of these cycles are worth more than others, more than just counting the number of transplants. So I may want to prioritize people that are disadvantaged, for example, that have uh, that uh, that are highly sensitized that most people can't give to. If I can get them in a chain, I might want to make that more likely. So I can choose different utilities here, but uh, so the sum of yi or the sum of yi times ui, if I've got different utilities. In the case we looked at, ui was just the number of transplants. <coughs> y equals zero or one, and then subject to, and these are the constraints, namely the sum over all i of uh, uh, where, where j is in ci. So we, we add up all the, we add, add up the indicators for all For all i such that j is in ci, that's right, yeah. So, so if I take j equals one, I'm going to add up the indicators for all the cycles that contain j, right? And they, that has to be less than or equal to one. I can't have j in more than one cycle that I choose. That's just, that's, it's just the same constraints that we had before. So <laughs> I said once this gets large, of course, we have many, many cycles and chains, and, and it becomes a very hard problem. But there are. Um, there are various softwares that will do things like this. Cplex and Garobi are two in particular that uh, give good solutions to such problems. They're not optimum solutions generally, but they give good approximate solutions to the problems. <clears throat> so that's just the same as before. And we can see here again the optimal choice very easily. But again, you could write this as an as a integer programming problem just like we did before. <clears throat> and this is again this idea of utility that we wouldn't have to just count the number of transplants. We might score some transplants as being more valuable than others. And so, <clears throat> so we might be interested in having utility on edge i to j. Uh, so that if donor i gives to candidate j, I might count that as one, as what we were doing before. Or I could count it as something different. And in particular, if, if the candidate at j was highly sensitized and hard to transplant, I might want to give a bonus so that if I can include them, I give myself more points for that. Okay? Or if, it's a, if, if J is, is an O type, it has blood type O, they're also disadvantaged because they can only receive from other blood type O's. And so I might give extra points for an O to O transplant. That, uh, so things like that. So we can have different, we can add in utilities like this on the edges. And then the utility of a cycle, we just add up the utilities on the edges. So. And that's what, those were the utilities in the integer programming problem. <clears throat> I know what's bothering me. I don't have the titles for the slides here. Are they up there? No. Okay. <laughs> I knew something was wrong here. Okay, maybe we're better use that. But, uh... So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about what I'll, the, the, the thing that we've been looking at up to this point, I'm going to call just maximum u utility um, based allocation. So. So MUC, maximum utility cycle-based allocation. 
And uh, <coughs> this is the idea of, of Roth, basically. Okay, so that the problem, though, is that, is that there's uncertainty in these things. So that so that even though you best laid plans, this sort of thing, right, right that you, uh, you you've got here a, a computer cross match that looks like this. So one can give to two, and there's an exchange here between one and three. Um, <coughs> When we actually do the, this is the computer cross match or the virtual cross match. When we actually do a lab cross match and check, it turns out that one to three isn't actually possible. But there's a reaction there, so we can't do that. So now we have reduced to just this cycle. We don't have the two way. And uh, here we've got other friction. It turns out that in fact, three to one also was not possible, perhaps because the donor or the, the candidate didn't like that donor, wouldn't, wouldn't accept that donor. So. <laughs> So we end up basically with, although we start off something that looked quite promising here, we end up with nothing. Okay? We can't do anything here. Yeah. So we've got this, this notion of, of friction or probabilities of failures or, or probability of success. Um, and uh, they're due to, these failures are due to various things. <clears throat> so the first thing we thought about doing was, well, why don't we use expected utilities instead of utilities? So if we have probability models here, why not just use expected utilities instead of utilities? And that's got to be better. In fact, it is better. But uh, <coughs> PIJ then is the probability that uh, the edge from I to J is viable. I'm going to think about a probability model on this. In fact, we don't have a lot of information on this, but uh, it turns out if you, just put in, if you just put in the uncertainty, that's better than ignoring it. So even if you just put a good guess at the uncertainty, that tends to be better than ignoring it. Yeah. So PIJ is the probability that edge from I to J is viable. QI is the probability that vertex I is available. So, that, uh, so we could either have the edge fail or the vertex fail. Okay. <coughs> and we assume that all probabilities are, are independent. That, again, is an assumption that I really can't justify, although it uh, seems a good thing to do when all else fails. And then a cyclic chain is, 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 is viable just with the, with the product of the edge and, and node probabilities. So that if I think about this exchange, simple exchange one to two, it's going to be viable if uh, one, two is, is successful, two, one is successful, Q1 and Q2 are both there. So it's just that product, right? So any exchange that I look at, I can actually get the probability of success from this model, okay? assuming independence. Yeah. And then so once I've got that, now I've got the probability that the chain is successful. I know the utility of the cycle or chain. And so the expected utility is just U of C times P of C. Okay? Now it's the same as before, right? If I, if I actually know these probabilities, then I can get ut expected utilities instead of utilities, use the same integer programming problem, and, and, and solve it. Okay? <clears throat> so we, we use the disjoint cycles to minimize the expected utility instead of the utility. Again, we're still choosing disjoint cycles, right? <clears throat> so just an example of MEUC, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but the idea basically is that I can, if I take C1 first, um, exchange 1 to 2, and that's the first one, the chance that it's viable is 2 times 1 times 0.5, right? Sorry, the expected value of C1, rather, is 2. I get 2 if it's viable. The chance that it's viable is 1 times 0.5 is the chance that this one's viable. And then 0.8, I'm assuming that there's a friction of 0.8 on each node. So that this one survives with 0.8 and this one with 0.8. So C1 is, is, has an expectation of 0.64. So it would give me two if it works, but there's a good chance it won't. Okay. <clears throat> if I look at C2, one, two, three, I can, I can um, again also look at this and, and look around this cycle. So one, one to two, two to three, three to one, I get three if it works. I can write down the probability that it works. Okay? And the product of those two is the expected value for C2, and it turns out to be um, 0.768. Okay? <laughs> and similarly for C3, the exchange between 3 and 4, I can work that out as well, 0.384. And here I would uh, choose C1 and C2 again, because uh, the sum of these two utilities is bigger than this one. Okay? Okay, but it's the same problem just replacing utilities with expected utilities. Okay. 
well, in fact, it's pretty obvious here that you can do better than this, right? That if I chose one, two, three here, if I chose that, if I chose C2, I actually have a fallback, right? That if, if one of these edges, if this edge fails or this one, I can still do this, I can still do that exchange, okay? So if I choose one, two, three, and actually also check this edge, I can do one, two, three if everything works. If, it, if, if either this or do, this doesn't work, then I can do this exchange. If that doesn't work either, then I can't do anything. Right? <clears throat> okay, and that's, that's the, the next idea really was, was fallback options or contingency plans. And I'm gonna take these cycles or chains, I'm gonna look at the cycle or chain, I'm going to ask, well, I'm going to look at, at the poss possibility, what I can do basically if some things fail. I'm going to think about fallbacks. We're going to take that into account in finding the expectation and then the optimization is going to be looking for chains and cycles that have a lot of fallbacks. Right? That's going to be a good thing. Okay. <clears throat> so sometimes we can choose these chains and cycles in particular with one, two, three here with this cycle. If it fails, I can actually do one, two. Okay. So if either 3, 1 or 2, 3 is not viable, I can still fall back to this. Okay. <clears throat> and so we're going to think of these not, not as cycles now, but think of them as sets. So, so C, C1 is the set 1, 2, 3, and I'll do the best thing. If I choose those three, I'll do the best thing. I'll either do the cycle if I can. If I can't, I'll do the exchange. Okay. <clears throat> so we change from th thinking about these things in terms of cycles and chains to think about choosing sets, okay, and, and taking advantage of fallbacks. Yeah. <clears throat> and so now if we, if we do that, if I want to find this expected utility now of, of thinking about one, two, three now, the other two don't change because there's no fallbacks, right? So S1 is, uh, is this, this set here, one and two, three and four, but now I'm gonna think about one, two, three as a choice, okay? And there, one possibility I can do is, is, um, is, is the full exchange, or I could fall back to this. So if I think about its expectation, it's not what it was before. Right? Now I'm going to think about an expectation which looks, first of all, at uh, what happens if they all work. That's what I had before. And now I'm going to say, but what if this fails, or this fails, or this node is not here? Okay? Then um, I'll have a fallback, so I get an extra term here. So I get this if I can do the whole thing. If I can't do the whole thing, then I need that these two work, okay? um, <clears throat> that these two work, and, and, and which, which says that this one fails, this one fails, or this fails. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> so you think about this, the expected value for choosing S2 as a set, if I think about it as a set, it's bigger than it used to be. It's 1.152 now. Okay? It's got that fallback. And in fact, it's better than choosing the other two. You know, these are sort of quite artificial kinds of examples, but this carries through to the large, the large, the large KPDs as well. Okay, that if we, um, that, <clears throat> that taking account of these fallbacks, we're going to tend to choose things like this that have fallbacks and we'll be able to improve. Right. So that's the second thing is the expected utility of an exchange set. So still we're choosing cycles and chains, right? but we're taking account of what we can do if things break down. Okay, so we're looking at all the possibilities of breakdowns and taking account of that. Okay. I'll say a little bit later about how we, how we do these calculations in a systematic way, because there's sort of an obvious way you can do it, but there's actually a way which is quite a bit more efficient. Um, <clears throat> So this is the, what we call the MEUS, kind of terrible acronym, but anyway, Maximum Expected Utility Set-Based Algorithm. So now we're still using cycles and chains, but we're thinking of the cycles and chains as sets. Okay. And we thought we made a big advance here until suddenly we sort of thought about it a bit more and said, well, there's no real reason we need to choose cycles and chains as the sets. We could choose anything as a set and do the same thing. So I could just decide I'm going to choose sets of size four and choose them in such a way as to, as to, maximize, the, as, as to maximize the expected utility. So, I, so now I'm gonna think about choosing a set of a given size, let's say size four, and I'll look at getting then sets of size four or less actually, so four or three or two. Every time I choose such a set, okay, 
Um, <clears throat> I'll take into account the fallback options in calculating its expected utility. And I look choices of sets that maximize the expected utility in that case. So it's the same as before, except now we're no longer constrained to cycles and chains. <clears throat> so the sets don't need to be cycle or chain based. Um, <clears throat> A subset S of vertices in a graph G then is, is locally relevant. We'll say it's this, this is our definition. So we're going to look at a subset S of vertices in a graph G. So now we've got a KPD and I'm going to look at a subset S of say four vertices or five vertices. Yeah. And I'll think, I'll think actually about the graph that that induces. So it, within that there's a, there's a subgraph basically of the original graph which are the exchanges in S. Yeah. So a subset S of vertices in the graph G is locally relevant, and I'll write it LR3, 4, with respect to cycles of size 3 and chains of size 4. It could, of course, be anything. It wouldn't have to be 3, 4. It, it could be, i could going to get chains, cycles of a given size and chains of a given size. If any partition of S into two non-empty parts results in the loss of at least one chain of size 4 or less, or one cycle of size 3 or less. So if I, if I break the graph in two, I'm going to lose, if I break this subset in two, I'm going to lose either a cycle or a chain of size three or less or four or less, respectively. Okay. <clears throat> so it's actually, these things are strongly connected and they're strongly connected in a specific way. They're strongly connected with respect to cycles and chains of a certain size. That, uh, um, so if we, look, if we look at this graph here, this is, this is actually, this is actually um, locally relevant of size 3, 4. Okay. This graph, it's also locally relevant 3, 3. So if I break this graph anywhere, if I, if I break it into two parts, I'm always going to lose a cycle of size 3 or less, and I'm, or, a, or a chain of size 4 or less. Okay. I'm always going to lose one of those. That's true also for 3, 3, okay, for this graph. Okay, so we have this idea of, of, of graphs that are, are we'll call locally relevant. Okay, they're connected, and they're connected in the sense that if I break them, I lose a cycle or I lose a chain of interest. Okay? So I'm interested in chains of size 3 or less, chains of size 4 or less, or cycles of size 3 or less. And if I break this graph, in, if I break this subset into two parts, I lose at least one of those. In fact, one can show that that's what you need to concentrate on if you're going to look at subsets of a given size or less. Okay. <clears throat> so the idea is here we consider a class then of, of things. We choose a value n, which might be n equals 5, for example. So we're going to look at subsets of size 5 or less. Okay. And we're going, to, we're going to choose ones that are strongly connected with respect to 3 and 4. Okay. So I'm going to look at all the sets in here of size n within the graph okay, that are strongly connected with 3, 4 with respect to cycles and chains of size 3 and 4 and are of size less than or equal to n. Okay. They have n or fewer vertices. Okay. <clears throat> it turns out that if you're going to, if you're interested in looking at sets of size n, as I said, that's the, those are the sets you need. And there's no point in extending it. You can't do any better. Yeah. That's, that's fairly easy to show. Yeah. <clears throat> So the, this idea that we've got, we've got things which are connected, I'm going to look at sets of size 4, let's say, or sets of size 5 or less, and make sure that they are strongly connected. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to choose values of n, x, and y. Typically we take x equal 3, that's the size of the cycle, cycles of size 2 or 3 only. And y actually, less than or equal to 4 I've written here, um, but uh, wouldn't have to be that, but, but chains of size 4 are as long as one would ever usually think about. That. <coughs> so this, so if, we, if we're going to implement this, then what we have to do is find all the sets in L, R, S, X, Y, N. Okay? So I want to find all sets in this graph, this picture from the Michigan run, all sets in that graph that are of size um, let's say with n equals 5, five sets that are of size 5 or less and are locally relevant with respect to cycles and chains. Okay. 
And that's actually an interesting um, problem. And in, in, in graphs, actually, we've developed sort of constructive algorithms to find all of these so that we can, we can do this in five, six, and seven. We can find such things in fairly large graphs. <clears throat> so now again, we've got, we, we're going to have these, all these possible sets, okay? and now we're going to choose disjoint sets okay, in order to optimize the expected utility. So again, it's back to the same problem as before and the same integer programming problem. <clears throat> so now we'll check uh, um, okay so, so now we've got this so now we'll, we'll find the expected utility of each such set that's the same problem as before solve the IP problem and, uh, um, and, and here we're going to have very big IP problems it becomes, that becomes the, the bottleneck is actually solving that problem <clears throat> once the final um, once, the, once these final locally relevant sets are selected, so once we get an actual solution, we're going to check all edges and nodes to see if they work and do what we can. That's the, do the best thing we can. Okay. So actually, this just to illustrate the idea here, this is a Michigan match run. I don't know how I ended up with, because I, I had fixed up these typographical errors, but I think I've got the wrong file here. Anyway. <coughs> So here we've got uh, a Michigan match, match run with pool size of 37 pairs and two altruistic donors, the one that we looked at earlier. Um, and we're looking at uh, actually, and actually we're looking at SCC, okay. Um, but with a friction set at 20% at on, on, on edges, I think it is, yeah. So at any rate, we've got, so we've got locally relevant sets of size n equals five, so sets are size five or less, okay. And uh, we want chains of cycles of length three and chains of length four. So we want every set to be minimal. We want every set to be locally relevant with respect to those. Okay. <laughs> and we go through this integer programming problem, and we get the, the best solution. And we end we end up with with three sets here. Okay. Um, and they're a little bit hard to see, but if we look at the, at the first set here, is has got uh, five points. This is an altruistic donor here, blue. And uh, if you think about, if you look at this set, it's got five points, and there's all sorts of things you can do here. There's a cycle of length three here. Okay? There's an exchange here of, of, of two. Um, there's uh, another cycle of length three. No, there isn't, I guess. There's an exchange here of length two. There are all sorts of chains that I can go from here to here to here to here. Okay? Or I can go from the altruistic donor from here to here. Can't go anywhere else from there. Um, but I could also go from here to here to here. So there's all sorts of chains and there's all sorts of cycles in this picture. Okay? And so I get, I get this particular structure and I look at it and, and I say, well, let's, let's look at all the transplants in here, see which ones work and which ones don't, and do the ones that we can, do the best we can. And similarly with this one, this is actually just three points, but there's actually two fallbacks. There's a, a two-way exchange here and a two-way exchange here, and this is just a two-way exchange. So this turns out to be the best solution with these uh, LRSs of three, four, five. <clears throat> the next step then is to check to see what works and what doesn't. Okay? And that's here. So we now we're looking at these chosen cycles and chains, and we see that in fact that this edge breaks down. That guy's gone completely. Okay? Sickness here, so this person dropped out. Um, <clears throat> this edge doesn't work. This edge doesn't work. Um, similarly over here, this edge doesn't work. And there's a, one of the edges here didn't work, and this one we lost that, uh, that node. Okay? So when, once we look at this, we see that we've, we've lost a lot of possibilities. Right? But we can still say, what's the best thing we can do in each case? And here it's quite clear that the best thing we can do is to take this two-way exchange. Here there's nothing. Right? Here we can take uh, this two-way exchange, and we can, take the psych we can take the chain just of length one here. So if you look at that a bit, a bit further, you can see, and you can actually, if you've got larger things, you may need to solve it. But uh, here we can see we've got, this is the best we can do, given the situation of what works and what doesn't. Got a two-way exchange here, a chain of length one, and a two-way exchange here. Okay. Everything else fell to pieces because of the failures. So that's the basic idea. and. Uh, um, <clears throat> 
that's, that's the basic idea in, in all of this, and, uh, um, and we get con considerable gains from doing that. <clears throat> okay, I think this is uh, to do with, what time is it? Yeah, I better, I'll leave this out. This is actually finding expected utilities, and the idea here is that we're going to, once we choose a set, if we want, it, we want to know its expected value, okay? Um, then we have to, then basically the idea here is you think of the best thing you could possibly do, the next best thing, the next best thing in that set and use that and it turns out that leads to a very simple simulation too. So in large ones you can simulate quite simply and quite quickly. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm going to compare some, some um, allocation strategies then just to look at, at We've done a lot of simulations on these things, and I'm just going to show you one to get you a feeling as to what uh, we can do. Um, so this is looking over a, a, a longer period of time, and these, these kidney pair donations, they're set up, and you look at each month, let's say, you look at the who's in the pool, and you decide what exchanges you can do, and then anything that doesn't work, you put back in the pool and move along. New people come in, and as things are exchanged, they leave the pool. So these are called match runs, and this we're going to look across eight match runs. Between each, each match run, we have 30 pairs and one altruistic donor who arrives to the pool. <coughs> and we do this actually by choosing the pairs and the donors from the, from the Alliance for Paired Donation, their records, and also the Michigan transplant. So we actually do sort of a hot dick simulation on this. At the end of each month, we're going to create a graph for the match runs. We look at the virtual cross matches, and we um, then choose the results. Um, we have to put in probability distributions, and this is just looking at uh, the probabilities for on the edges um, are the something that depends on the degree of sensitization plus a sort of a friction of 10% and 20% or zero, and similarly on the nodes friction. And then we do allocations using each of these four methods I suggested, the MUC, MEUC, MEUS, this is sets based cycles, and here's the, just the locally relevant subsets. Yeah. <clears throat> each, each match run we have a certain probability of individuals leaving the pool, and uh, altruistic donors might renege at a rate of about 1%. These are fairly close to what's seen in the Alliance for Paired Donation. <clears throat> so I'm going to compare chains of different lengths. This is a, a, one way of using donors. I'm going to think about using altruistic donors each match run. We'll get as large a chain as we can from altruistic donors. And at the end of the altruistic donor, anybody who's at the, the donor with the last pair that's transplanted will move on as an altruistic donor in the next round so that uh, the chains continue from round to round, so build up. That, uh, so I'm going to think of chains of length, chains or altruistic donor chains of length three, four, and five, and compare them with two, actually a special version of two. <clears throat> so I'm going to look at uh, at MUC. This is the um, this is the idea of, of Roth, just using utility-based things that doesn't take probabilities of failure into account. This takes the expectation into account. These are sets based on chains and cycles, and these are sets based on locally relevant subsets. Turns out that as the length of the chains increases, it gets more and more complicated as you move down here. It's very complicated to look at larger chains here because there's so many possibilities. Um, and in, in this simulation in particular, we had to stop the, um, at, at chains of length three for the final one. <clears throat> but this is actually looking under different conditions with respect to the probability of failure. And if the probability of failure is quite low, then in fact you st still get some improvement, but everything does reasonably well. Okay. But as the probability of failure increases, then you're much better to plan. In other words, to take into account that things might fail and choose your sets so that things might fail, to, to allow for things to fail. And one finds here, in fact, that you get about 30% to 40% increases over the standard methods based on MUC in this case, so that uh, so that by, by taking this into account, we get substantial increases in the number of transplants that are done. <clears throat> so it's actually looking at a standardized version, but this is essentially proportional 
to number of transplants. So just a, a few concluding remarks, I guess. First thing is that, that it's important to think about uncertainty in these things. That it's important to think about fallbacks so that if, when you choose these sets, you're thinking about what might happen if things fall apart. Um, and in fact, you can get quite large gains. The more the friction, the better the gains. And we've got uh, simulation models that we're using and developing further to, to implement these things. <clears throat> the um, simulations are, are quite extensive, and actually we use large clusters and that sort of thing to do them. But uh, um, if, you, if you're just looking at a particular case, it's not, it's not so daunting. That, uh, some new directions that we're looking at, we're looking at deceased donors as altruistic donors and chains. So the idea is that you divert a certain number of donors from the deceased donor pool as altruistic donors in the chains and start chains and then go back to the deceased donor pool. So we're trying to develop simulations there that would sell Congress that that might be something they, they regulated, uh, that that might be something that they might allow. Um, <clears throat> they regulate the deceased donor pools, um, including multiple donors, as I mentioned earlier. International connections, we're trying to establish some international connections which would, would bring in different pools. And uh, it, the, the advantage there being that you've got different gene pools in North Korea than the US, for example. And if you can set up an arrangement there, then you're going to get less difficulties with sensitivities. That, uh, and the, a mathematical problem or a computing problem of substantial importance is how to deal with this IP program. Because as you get into these more complicated things, it becomes more and more difficult to solve that. But, OK, and I think that's it. This is actually from the New York Times. It's actually 60 lives, 30 kidneys. These are, it's a big chain that was built up over time, starting with one altruistic donor and resulting in 30 transplants. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's it. Um, I have my standard slide for questions. These are some in references, and I can provide references if anybody wants them. And uh, <clears throat> this is comments and questions. Escher, get your ass up here. That, uh, um, but anyway, happy for any questions or comments. Okay. We do have a few moments for questions. Anyone, Erica? I noticed in your concluding remarks, uh, you commented that the friction that was observed in reality exceeded any of the assumptions that you made. How do you Measure friction in reality. So, the, in the, in, for example, we work with the Alliance for Paired Donation, which is a, a multi center um, kidney paired donation program in the US. And, and so, they, when they do their match runs, they come up with suggestions. Actually, they use the Roth thing. We've been trying to convince them that they should switch, but we haven't quite managed yet. But, uh, although we're providing them with alternatives. But, uh, but they use the, just the, the just try and maximize the chain lengths. And in fact, what they find is that most of the time they can't, they can't do what they want. And that's because there's sickness, or there's a, a compatibility issue that they didn't anticipate, or somebody doesn't like what happened. And uh, so that, so that they're, they're, they see quite high failure rates of, uh, I'd, I'd like to say, of at least 50%, I think, in things that they try to do. And, yeah. yeah. In the, yeah, so that's a good question, I think. So you, um, yeah, and, and Lions Repaired Donation does do things like this. They don't do, they don't do exactly Roth. They actually do, they do several runs and try and get several optimums and then try to do them all at once. And so they're not really going ahead thinking about fallbacks, but they do in, include some fallbacks that way. And I think what they do is just explain to the patients what the, what the process is, you know, and, and that it's going to depend on what happens with the, cross, with the lab cross matches, what's going to happen, what happens with the availability of other people. And, and so that when you get chosen for this, there's no guarantee that it will actually result in, in a transplant. So, so I think that, that's laid out clearly in, in advance. And no matter what you do, that's going to be the case, that you're going to have uh, you're going to say, well, we're going to try a three-way exchange, but sure enough, somebody's sick and you can't do it. Or, uh, yeah. But the, you might imagine that the patients might push for transparency. You have, they might be pushing for transparency, and you have to explain that this is complicated, 
Uh, yeah, I don't think you try that. <laughs> but I, but I think but I think they I mean they I think patients do like the idea that there's something being done which is which is objective in terms of what the selections are made what selections are made rather than something that's driven by the clinician's uh, preferences. And uh, so I think they, they like that idea. I think that's something that you can sell to them. But they, yeah. Harder to sell that to the clinicians, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. if a given solution is not viable after the lab cross-match and the friction is all worked out and taken into account, is that indicative that the transplant will actually be successful? No. No, so all we're looking at is, is whether the transplant can proceed or not. But that's a very good question. Yeah, there's, there's a different, and that's sort of a, a problem with the word failure, I guess. But the failure means that you weren't able to go ahead with the transplant. Um, even if you go ahead with the transplant, it may, in fact, not take. It may not be a good, may not be a good solution. Typically, it is. But, uh, but it's not talking about that kind of failure at all. Yeah. One thing we do, though, in utilities is take into account what we expect to be, sometimes what we expect to be the outcomes. So you look at the expected survival of a graft if this donor gives to this candidate and try and, and then maximize the five-year expected survival in, in, the, in the program. Yeah. Any final question? <clears throat> Exchange, you talked about the possibility of having deceased donors as being the altruistic donor. How would that work when uh, a deceased donor's uh, kidney can only be used for a short period of time? So you'd have to be nimble, I guess. <laughs> That's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's certainly possible to do, to do that, but it would but it would require that the that it be worked into the uh, and there's there's a lot. Mike, Mike Reese, who's the president of the yeah. Alliance for Paired Donation, is very interested in trying to look at things like this, but. Uh, so you'd, you'd have to have the, the paired donation program set up so that it could act very quickly and, and have, have patients. But yeah, that's a, that's a, really, good, that's a, that's a really good question and, and something that has to be dealt with logistically. Yeah. Yeah. I was in a paired donor exchange program, and to answer that question, they just told me, you weren't a match this time, you weren't a match this time, you weren't a match this time for a couple of cycles. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. just wait. Yeah. Did, you, did they ever tell you you were potentially a match, but didn't uh, no, didn't fall through? No, told me I was a match. It went through. Went through. Yeah. 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 So I appreciate your work here. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Mm. All right. Thanks. So just to, to bring it to an end, I'll remind you that we have the reception <coughs> over in the math three building. So please come to that, and then um, you can just join me in thanking Jack one more time. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat>